All right, here we are. So welcome in everybody. Great to see you here this evening. Good evening from Concordia University's Force Space, located on unceded indigenous lands in Jojage, Montreal. At Force Space, something happens daily, and that's something that action, that coming together, that connectivity and moment of exchange is directly linked to the research initiatives and class activities at Concordia University. Essentially, the work happening across uni, work that might culminate in some seriously fun reads from brand new poetry books by Jason Camelot and John Emil Vincent. Here to tell you more about it, please help me welcome tonight's host, Catherine McLeod. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Anna. Welcome everyone to A Belly Full of Vlarf. We'll be hearing some seriously fun readings from brand new books of poetry by Concordia faculty Jason Camelot and John Emil Vincent. The format of today's reading is inspired by the long format readings held in the 1960s and 70s at Sir George Williams University, which is now Concordia. A poet would often read their entire book with readings often lasting an hour long or even longer. They would also often start around 9 p.m. We're not gonna do that tonight, but something quite similar. The recordings of that reading series were the archival recordings that in many ways started the Spoken Web project, which now has grown into a shirk funded partnership across universities that brings together researchers studying literary audio recordings. That project is led by Jason Camelot, and he was the one who took interest in that box of tapes holding the recordings of those long format readings in the Sir George Williams series. Spoken Web is how I met Jason Camelot, and after working with Jason on many collaborative events and publications through Spoken Web Research, it is a real honor to be hosting today's launch. My name is Catherine McLeod, and my role in hosting today's book launch is to guide you into the belly full of larf, and then guide you back out at the end. Once the readings start, they will follow one another, alternating until close to 6 p.m. There will not be a break. So if you do need to pause, maybe run out to the washroom, it's just around the corner, or if you're tuning in from home and need to make a cup of tea, we welcome you to do that. And yes, this event is being broadcast. I'm speaking here to an audience in Force Space, and I'm also speaking to you tuning in from home. Uh, my thank you to Force Space for hosting us here today, and a warm welcome to all of you tuning in from home. We invite you to say hello in the chat. Um, and even though there won't be a formal Q&A at the end, we also invite you to share your comments or questions there because the authors will be reading through that chat afterwards. Uh, and I can even share a few highlights from that at the end. We are here at Four Space on the main floor of the library building at Concordia University. The space has a window out to the very snowy Maisonneuve Boulevard, and the space has windows in which we can look out onto that street. And in fact, the sounds of this reading will be projected out onto the street for many students passing by. Here at Force Space, with this wall open to the space outside, it's a constant reminder of the relation between ourselves and the spaces we inhabit and move through. It's always meaningful, too, to be here at Force Space. It's a space that, during the pandemic, was very supportive of collaborations happening online. Jason Camelot and I led a Force Space listening event related to our podcast that we called How Are We Listening Now? The online event brought together many poets, artists, and Concordia grad students, some of you who are here in the room tonight, for a very timely conversation about our changing sonic environment. It inspired Jason and myself to write an article called Pandemic Listening, and that article has just been published in the journal Canadian Literature. The article and the various media that inspired us to delve into what happens to poetry readings as they move online 
makes it all the more meaningful to have this really beautifully hybrid event today. One in which it is a reading that is accessible to a wider audience, and also one that brings poets right here to the microphone while they speak to you, the audience, waiting to see what will happen. So without any further ado, let's see what will happen. I'm going to introduce this afternoon, or really what feels like tonight, uh, tonight's readers at this point, and um, I'll start with John. John Emil Vincent has written several books of poetry, including Excitement Tax and Ganymede's Dog. He lives in Montreal and teaches creative writing in Concordia's Department of English. His book and those two books that I just mentioned are available for purchase after tonight's reading over at the book table. And I'll say more about that at the end. Uh, but I just realized that I'd just seen those two titles over there at the table as well as his new book. What I would also like to bring to your attention is that the readers tonight, John and Jason, are readers and really listeners to each other's works. I asked Jason what we should listen to or what he would invite us to listen to in John's reading. Jason replied that he suggests that we listen for John's explanation of the meaning of friendship in Gilgamesh. All right then, we'll be listening for that and for all of the nuances of friendship in John's poems. Then Jason Camlot. Jason Camlot is the author of five collections of poetry, including The Animal Library, Attention, All Typewriters, and What the World Said. He is a professor of English and research chair in literature and sound studies at Concordia University here in Montreal. I asked John, what would he invite us to listen to in Jason's poetry? And he suggested these lines. For him, these lines are like a Zen koan that hold both the mystery and the secret. They are lines from the poem Moss. My living feet alive to all the dying threads. John Emile Vincent and Jason Camlot. Hi there. Um, it's really great to be here with Jason and all of you. Uh, first, thank you, Fourth Space, Fourth Space folks, and thank you, Catherine, for emceeing. That's delightful. Last time I saw her, she was flamenco dancing, which was even more delightful. Um, but there are a number of people present and virtual I'd like to thank about work with Bitter in the Belly. Um, it was a real pleasure working with Alan Hepburn and Carolyn Smart at McGill Queens Press. Um, really appreciate them and their work. They run a lovely series and basically pay exquisite attention to their books, which is great. Um, and thanks to the folks at the press, in particular Kathleen Fraser, who caught a, a number of wonderful things in her unequaled copy editing. <laughs> um, and as he was my first and last editor for Excitement Tax, my first book, Jason was my first editor for Bitter in the Belly as well. And it's super nice to be here reading with him because I wouldn't be here without him. Um, so, in order to just to give you an idea of what I'm going to do, um, I'll read a number of short lyrics to begin. I hope this is not too loud. Um, the first of which is a poet, the poetic and metaphoric introduction to Bitter in the Belly. It's a, it's a small untitled poem, or what um, you could call a proem, if you will, and if you won't, you can just call it a small untitled poem. Um, this is called The Past Grabs Back, What It Lets Us Handle. I hope this mic is more or less in the right place. The past grabs back what it lets us handle. To always mourn one solution, never to another, or sing along, dogs tuning to sirens. And the second poem um, I'll read was a response, it is a response to a drawing by Federico Garcia Lorca, which I'll try to put up on the screen here. We'll see whether I can do this. There we go. Um, that's the picture, or, or uh, actually, so um, as you can see, this is this is a, a piece by Federico Garcia Lorca. I'm sorry that you guys can't really miss this. Can you? 
Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, basically, it's um, it's called Young Man and Sailor, and the two figures each evacuate the other's perspectival volume by being laid one atop the other and meeting at their lips, as you can see. Um, so basically, I, with this poem, I'm trying to create a similar effect to Lorca's ink drawing, but um, but I'd like to try it, or I, tr I tried to do it sort of in oils. Um, and this is called Young Man and Sailor. Young Man and Sailor. At this fountain, the sailor can think only to piss the surface clean of reflection. The care with which his fingers free the necessary part seems promising for him as a lover. The moon shatters, shatters, buckles, shakes itself out and reappears nonchalant. Tucked back in, he's too much yours, a mere extra in your movie, snagging the prop bourbon from the pool's ledge. Look, he points, as he drapes his bottle-weighted arm around your neck. Its reflection rests on the crest of that moon. You become a face next to his on the breathing belly of the water, a hip that gives to his hip, eyes locked on themselves. You want him and his eye for detail right there, where need and willingness meet at one forceful point, so only their disturbance shows. This is called Raised Far From Rivers, and is, I think, will explain itself. Raised Far From Rivers. Raised Far From Rivers, I didn't know smooth sheets of motion. Things stopped and after became their stillness. Days ran into months and disappeared. The calm of any plural threatened. Once I dreamt I as E.E. E. Cummings, steadier of hummingbirds, wrote a twister, a long fading moan. I bucked roofs. They flew clean as circumflexes from telegrams. Row upon row, block by block, what I knew came visible. I chopped into basements, expecting boxes of wigged dead heads. Instead, I found buried, stacks of photos, pictures of fountains, pictures of rivers. This next poem, um, I've been working with this poem for about 20 years, and I began it as an undergrad, but could never get it to sit still on the page until this book. Um, <laughs> and the way that it sits still is because I centered it on the page. So which, this is called Aqueduct. Aqueduct. <clears throat> I dropped into you to hear the deep base crack of ice, faults born while substance changes phases. But things did not break, the truth barreling through a badly told lie. The lie lingered, because I was not ice, I was stone, your finger bumping down my spine in smooth ellipses. So in Bitter in the Belly, there's a series of poems that are loosely inspired by Flaubert's Temptation of St. Anthony. Um, mostly, they're, I just stole the captions from my version, which is a semi-pornographic illustrated version. And so I use the captions to, to, to start about 10 poems. They're the titles. And this first one is just called St. Anthony. St. Anthony. Dithering. Can it be that old age is sainthood? Mortal acts? dirt worn off the artifact. Slumped, I can see just where they'll cut for relics. Anthony, your goodness, it waits to rip you to pieces. So these are some more of the captions. Um, this next one is called The Closed Eyes of the Ravished, one of my favorite captions. Um, the Closed Eyes of the Ravished. Asleep, or ecstatic, let them be, faces topographical with pleasure. They've been and seen too soon, but not too late. Their eyes don't roll up when their lids click closed. Spare them knowing, knowing won't spare them. This is another one of those called, Nay, he hath need of naught. He is a wise man. And this is about Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Immortality but not youth, fame without copyright, 
Living in a castle corner, the rest cordoned for tours. Gilgamesh, two-thirds god, knew all he did rid itself in stone, but would outlast him. He was, that is to say, humbled by his own greatness. Enkidu, his best friend, someone he could barely beat up, talked, tried to talk him out of lasting longer by dying faster. He said, in my dream, the hand that opens the gate goes weak. In my dream, Gilgamesh replied, our corpses are dragged and dumped in a pile. Heroes are scared sacred. Legends a brazier which gutters in the cold wind, a back door which opens only to squall and storm, a battering ram reversed by the enemy, a crippling shoe. All is paradox, predictable, and sad. Enkidu says, why does your heart speak strangely? I tire of this, says Gilgamesh. Stamp me in gold already. This is called, that they may uphold him horizontally, another caption, which I like a lot. And it has a fictional character, which is supposed to be me, but it, it became little Hans. <laughs> I'll just leave that where it is. <laughs> that they may uphold him horizontally. Little Hans naps, face pressed to the couch pillow's button. He'll have to be carried up. But what he wants, to be too heavy, but still to have to be carried. Fame, he thinks, like fame. Blessed are the famous, loved and unmoved. This one is called the fierceness of pleasure. I understand the beasts, they mean only harm. Stay, but when you hear the blood feast, run and then stand right where my cries turn demands. This is called singeth love words. The rich are sad. They've had their troubles taken from them. Shiny fingertips scale their pineapples. The professionals are sad. They've had boredom taken from them. Plush are their chairs, strained, their belt leather. The past is sad, dragged as it is behind, and the future is sad, all it left, the tatters. How to sit and not feel the heartache of each thing. This is called anger. Anger. Midfield, there is a spout of flame. We honor it with our dead, at whom, of course, we're angry. But the living, it is inelegant to hate them. Why spend anything on what you can abandon? And this is called the whole firmament that turned even as we turned. The whole firmament that turned even as we turned. You were the exception when you didn't feel one. And finally, to end this series, this is called Enough Hast Thou Slept. I thought I'd say that real loud. <laughs> what are you doing here? Ordinary men are hacking other ordinary men exquisitely in half. Your friends, could they in uniform point the way ladies and gentlemen to the gas? The thickets you'll scratch and scrape through aren't nightmares. Worse, they aren't nightmares. This is called una chupacabrita, and it's trying to be an ode to a little chupacabra, a vampiric creature from folklore and urban legend, possibly from space. This is, oh wait, I'm on the wrong. Oy. He sits in the hands like a gun meant for a purse. His crest, his seahorse tail, his greenish, almost scaled skin. To be dead means to be identified, or at least no longer a mystery. So they all think. In that dinosaur saw blade skull, 
Digits are turning to goats and goats to cows and cows to fountains. As sort of beautiful as a wedding ice sculpture, but faster and melting. Sweet creature, how can incipients be not be innocent? Or no, how can fierceness in its earliest form not be celebrity? How can we leave these little-eared seahorse mermaid blood-sucking legends to die alone? We also die a little. We are either fountains or thirsts. We are stonewalled pools or the weird young people who stomp around on cool nights, I guess drunk, and splash one another and think, this is innocence. When in fact, it is una chupacabrita, incipience, violence, calm. Play with your hand gadgets, walk with your head down, but no children, kids, near adults. Something is younger yet and curled in a warm hand, and if we can do it, brought back and yawning and hungry. We'll feed it things from banks of freezers, and best to think it is not just where we end, but a place we never leave. Chupacabrita, the life we used to give you was as ranchers. We had valuables grazing. Now, sweet thing, we are the valuables. When you grow, no, we can't blame anything for anything. We've lost the footing to period that sentence. And dear thing, perhaps you will kill me or someone I love. Perhaps you are wayward nature or an eye infected driver or a jerk with something to prove. But as all these, I do love you still. Can I love you still, curly tailed beast, funny seahorse, prose poem of creatures? I will love you. With you grown and curled over a donkey, a dead donkey, whose face was so big it was only comparable to a moon, whose face was so scully it got human, because like humans with hollows, it looked both hungry because thoughtful and the other way round. I could watch you do what you will do should you grow, and I might chase you for football fields, but still, no, it is only part of you I chase, but the whole of you runs. Oh, thank you. I'm going to take you again. Um, actually, the next poem is just called Story, and it's sort of a story. Um, but it's also the, sub the story is the subject of the poem as well. Story. First, she thought, that could be me. Then, thank God it's not. But it followed her from the break room. The drill press made repeated suggestions. The card clock stapled it to her sleeve. Surely everyone else saw it, thought it a remnant of her neglect. The clerk snagged her cigarettes from above his head without looking. He bagged the tampons quickly, left the gum on the counter. Why an escaped dwarf? Why an unrealistic family, each behind a curtain opened at the touch of a button? Her Dotson hunkered. Inside, the smell of new heat. The roads swallowed snow. And the front door was unlocked, but she only read it that afternoon after leaving the Cheerios toppled and spilled over the spare key. She must have left all the lights on on purpose, the shower dripping, every window open, an icicle on the bathroom faucet, shy and shiny as a tear. The shower curtain pulled full around. The heat clanked to catch up. Closing each window, latching each window, she recalled sidestepping the center of the hallway, stepping around it, no mark, but she stepped around it again, understood something missing. The end of the story was unconvincing though. Revenge is never ziplocked. It is what starts stories and the dead always come back as earaches or missing buttons. Putting the kettle on felt epic, pulling the tea bag from its sleeve definitive and the salt and pepper shakers were each toppled next to a knife out of the block. She'd forgot her trip to the bank, she'd forgot dinner, she'd hurried past the clogged mailbox. The setting wasn't even convincing. But now one spool unraveled, its thread stabbed into canvas in rows, formed a sack. Rocks rimmed the dead herbs out back, they clacked in the sack, sound of boats at dock. The hatchback groaned open, the bag curled perfectly around the spare, the drive was short, the lake frozen, hard to chip. Now and then the boom of great plates suturing. Then there was a hole. The, slacks, the sack slid into it like oil. The shattered ice 
rippled back, little flows rocked and settled as if a puzzle done just to do a puzzle for the hundredth time. She smoked all the way home. Where was the circus now? Who had a circus in the dead of winter? In what trailer did occupants persist on bourbon and canned sausages? It wasn't hers, the story, but she worked at it. And shifting on her seat, a necklace snagged the seatbelt. A necklace she'd never seen before plopped its beads into her lap. This is another sort of story poem. This is my second last for this little period. Um, and this is called Thought Experiment. It's in a similar mode to the last, and it's, it's a thought experiment, and it's entitled Thought Experiment. It's also sort of like a New Yorker cartoon, if you will. You, you, can, you might imagine the one. A man washes up on a desert island. Next to him, the book he never read. Mostly, he finds the characters flat, the situation's improbable. His self slides through the lines like floss. It's a book about a family, so big they people a continent. Restless, they build ships and subdivide the moon. Finally, space unfashionable time gentrifies, stepping back centuries or forward as they please. No one is ever happy in this book. Ancestors begin to win all the tennis. One boy gets so bored he takes poison, but his father grounds him to the day before. The dad is a decent man, though, as everyone knows, he fucks goats. There he is, belt clanking at his ankles, bliss on his face. He was stoic when his wife climbed back to the treehouse with her brother. The man is kind. People come to him for advice. He begins to age, develops memories. Giddy, he names each wrinkle. One day, he ungrounds his son. The next, he buries him. He builds a real-time sanctuary, invites people. They watch iced teas sweat on porch railings, keep diaries. The goats certainly seem happy. But the stranded man wants to punch someone. And in the book, it is he who does slug the goat fucker over and over, saying, I'll give you happy. Yeah, I'll give you happy. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and this is the last poem of this segment. And it's about what's happening outside that you can't really see because it's all behind you. But I'll describe it for you. It's called First Snow, this poem. First snow. The lives that run streets return to plumb. I recall the cloud cover that eased you from your features, the sun that fetched you. All this weight and bright. The evergreens with their weird enthusiasms. The willows whips, in the wind whips. And down the hill, that bare stand of elms, the veins of a heart, to which it itself has lost its way. Thank you. I think I blew up your computer. Thanks, thanks, John. Um, I'd like to start with some thanks as well. Thank, first of all, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's really it's, it's special to be reading in person again to people and to everyone who's tuned in. Um, I'd love to thank Alan Hepburn and Carolyn Smart, who took a, a chance, who took a chance on Vlarf. It's like, you know, uh, Stephanie Bolster, uh, Dennis Denisoff and Herbert Tucker, who wrote some very kind words for the back of this book. Um, Sasha Minoli, Ann Ward, Kate Hall, Heather Jessup, who made beautiful chat books out of some of these poems over many years. Um, and the artists Betty Goodwin and J.R. Carpenter, who contributed visual work to those chat books when they were made. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for hosting tonight and for the many collaborations that we've worked on over the years. Uh, thanks to Nicola, Judith, Marcy, Kevin, and John. Um, the Homer Dante Merrill Reading Group uh, for allowing us to read our way through uh, the pandemic out loud together. Um, and to John, uh, really for serving as a, a sympathetic first reader of this manuscript and for sharing this, this and other launch events with me. 
it means a lot. Uh, finally, thanks especially to Corey, Oscar, Nava, Janice, my sister's here as well, um, uh, Finnick and Heike, uh, who are my reasons really to live and to write. So, people sometimes ask me, Jason, they say, <laughs> what is VLARF? Okay, well, I'm gonna sort of read the explanation that appears in the book. So there are quite a lot of notes in this book. Wikipedia explains that Flarf poetry was an avant-garde poetry movement of the early 21st century. Its first practitioners working in loose collaboration on an email listserv used an approach that rejected conventional standards of quality and explored subject matter and tonality not typically considered appropriate for poetry. One of their central methods was to mine the internet with odd search terms, then distill the results into often hilarious and sometimes disturbing poems, plays, and other texts. And when I was a graduate student in San Francisco, there were quite a few Vlarf, uh, nascent Vlarf poets at work, and so I, I spent some time with quite a few of them. Uh, Vlarf refers to a form of Victorianist Vlarf. So now you know what it means, in which expressions of sentiment that may have become unfamiliar, unacceptable, uncool since modernism are pursued by mining Victorian texts in generic forms with odd inclinations using techniques that include erasure, uh, cut up, bourrime, emulation, adaptation, reboot, mimicry, aberrance, cringe, and love. And so many of these poems, uh, as I've just said, are made out of um, pretty well known works of Victorian literature. And I'm, I'm going to show slides throughout my reading today because I'll give you some examples of um, the process. So the poem, the book opens with a poem called Lost Days. Um, this was um, a, a poem based on a Dante Gabriel Rossetti poem. I wrote about 10 of these, and this is the one that sort of made it into the book. Uh, so you can see what the original poem looked like. And um, this is my Bourrime poem based on Lost Days. The Victorian period is alive today. The sandwich men are lurking in the streets. They invented new machines for threshing wheat, hammers for pummeling men back into clay, systems to guarantee that workers pay with lacerated hands and blistered feet. Victorian children learned to cheat properly, to apologize always when battling other children to the death. A was for asylum, B for bricks, C for Crimean war. Victorian breath was just like ours, but lacy. Believe me when I say they prayed with words like saith. Their deeds have lived on for an eternity. And I should just say, if it's not obvious already, a Bourrime poem is you keep the rhymes of another poem and then you, you build a poem around that. I I've been fortunate over the years of writing some of these poems to have people illustrate some of them. So the next poem I'm gonna read is uh, called In the Criminal's Cabinet. And it actually was uh, in a, an anthology that took the title <laughs> without asking me actually uh, for the anthology and it called itself in the criminal's cabinet and an artist um, this was one artist rendition of this poem uh, i mentioned earlier that jr carpenter did some illustrations also for a chapbook version in which these appeared and so these are some of the images that she created uh, for this poem i'll just show you a couple of them and i'm going to end on this one in the criminal's cabinet, Sherlock Holmes discovers himself. Holmes entered the cabinet of the respectable reverend, who was in fact a closet naturalist, and found so many Victorian things. There were teapots and rare fatal cannons, coffins filled with roses, 
and tinted canvases in frames. Along one wall were hats on parade and fabrics, apparently from the time of Moses. Behind one glass case could be seen brass of superior quality and effigies of a more primitive culture. Behind another, artistic applications of electrotype, snuffed tapers and chandeliers, and beneath a glass tabletop, instruments for the manipulation of teeth. Holmes admired the japanned goods. He wondered at the strange colonial livestock and the new technology in underclothes. Umbrellas opened and closed apathetically. Then he found the full collection of thimbles. These tiny monstrosities of lead he screwed onto his fingertips to help explore himself further without fear of poisoned needles. Um, so there are many Victorian protagonists in this collection. It's sort of like, I suppose, a 21st century version of Eminent Victorians by Lytton Strachan. Um, this one is called Men of Letters. And in a way, it sets up a whole bunch of erasure poems that appear in the book that I'll get to soon. Men of Letters. In 1826, John Stuart Mill suffered his first mental crisis. He saw the aim of his desires, but he did not desire the aim of his desires. He understood that he no longer felt. Upon reading the memoir of Marmontel and a passage about the death of that author's father in particular, John Stuart wept consistently until the early 1830s when he first became a man of letters. In a monthly repository, he stored ideas about the intuitive truth of some words. His father had raised him as an experiment in education and had taught him the uselessness of wild imagination. But John Stuart, with all due respect, felt that words should be used to tear through the lucid veil as well as to teach what is pushpin. Years later, long after his father was dead, John Stuart suffered his second mental crisis, which he passed over in silence. He posed for a portrait showing the fragile head with its many bumps, signs of wisdom, or perhaps heartbreak. Another important Victorian thinker, John Ruskin, did not speak for the last 12 years of his life, although his collected works fill many thousands of pages. Those crazy Victorians, eh? So um, I'm going to read a few erasure poems. Um, based on the work of John Ruskin. I started this when I was a graduate student, and I think it was because I was, I was writing a chapter on John Ruskin for my dissertation, and um, it didn't feel very punk, uh, you know. I, I had to rebel somehow. Uh, and so I photocopied hundreds of pages of the works that I was writing about. And of course, we're always crossing out when we're writing about things, because we're only selecting portions to make our arguments on. But I, I literally just took a black china marker and crossed out really hundreds of pages of Ruskin. Uh, and sometimes I'd leave a word here or a word there. And so in a way, I realized in retrospect, as I, and as I began writing poems, that I was, I was trying to read Ruskin. I was, I was reading him for a critical purpose in my dissertation, but I was trying to read him for something else um, uh, when I was crossing him out. Um, and, you know, as you can see, sometimes a word like opal or the brain would be left, and then I would construct poems. It's just, you know, a lot of people work uh, with erasure as a technique of writing poetry. Um, mine just happened to sort of be a way of fighting off graduate student depression to begin with, and then, then became other things. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll read just a couple of these, including one that, uh, that John mentioned, which is the moss. But first I'll read uh, 
this one is called Flowers. Oh, and I did want to show, so these are, these are the works from which uh, I, these are the works I crossed out, you know, so you could see there are a lot of them, uh, a lot of different ones. And they have really poetic titles, like Deucalion, Collected Studies of the Lapse of Waves, and Life of Stones, things like that. So. Flowers. The flower's death is an offering, like dust falling into zones of fire. In summer, we come upon the gifts of bracts and stalks and tori and calices and corollas and discs and stamens and pistols. Take that cluster of bog heather bells, bunch them into a star. They can only be drawn as they grow. Take the dark contortion, the pale wasting, the quiet closing of the brown bells of the ling. Take this foretaste of fairy flowers, their petals wavering like the wings of human moths. Take this tiny red poppy, all silk and flame, burning in its own scarlet cup. If you offer a small bouquet of four, one pair is always smaller than the other. Take this humble host of green syllables, familiarly Englished into nectar. Take them from me gently, and then cast the severed leaves away. So as I said, these are pretty much all the words of Ruskin, just rearranged to my purposes. This one is called moss. moss. I observe a plant growing on other plants in dense festoons. Thin red threads sleeping on the heads of wheat. Tiny forests of little brown stems. A crest of spears balancing an emerald. I see, barely. This is the way mosses leave die. They decay invisibly in continual succession beneath the crest. I do not doubt that we carry memories of moss. If you've walked the moorlands enough, you will have felt them. So much for the human meaning of that decay. I must beg your pardon that I do not assert. I merely wander unshod, shedding hope in guarded fields, my living feet alive to all the dying threads. Um, so I constructed a bunch of poems right out of, uh, out of these um, erasures. And there were always some words that just didn't fit in anywhere. So this one is called Lines Left. I had a string of futile feelings about the dab chicks, but no longer. So I made pretty good, good use of the rest of the words. <laughs> I'm gonna end this uh, set, I guess, uh, with re uh, reading uh, the first part of the long, uh, long poem. There are quite a few long poems in this book um, there's a long dramatic monologue that I'll read after, um, but this one is called The Fruit Man, and it's essentially a kind of reboot of Christina Rossetti's inimitable poem, <laughs> Goblin Market. Um, and these are drawings that J.R. Carpenter did that kind of mimic the first publication of Goblin Market. Um, so these are just some of the images that relate to the poem. Oops, and so does that one, but I'm not going to read that part. That was a better good one image, but I'll just, I'll keep this one up here. And it has an epigraph from Goblin Market. Have done with sorrow. I'll bring you plums tomorrow. Part one. Once a week, his truck pulled up a blackened box on rusty wheels. Skidoo boots splayed like size 10 banana peels, overripe and lined with fleece. 
he trudged in our pristine snow, crushing rinds and seeds deep into the creases of his treads, his tracks, bas-reliefs of a pomegranate's insides, the late fruit's aftermath in heavy pairs up our path. My mother alone in the Paisley kitchen, talking on the phone, one of her sisters wishing calamity upon the other one, as far as I can tell, from my little room upstairs. 10-year-old me, Oscar Mellonby, happy as a pea in a single windowed pod, only with motifs of boats and the sea surrounding me and my imaginary albatross, Albie. My portal mirror on the wall promises that I'll be tall enough one day to travel all the way from Montreal to the summits of Nepal and back again in time to keep my mother from her deep despair. My mother is my single care. She travels with me everywhere because I would not dare leave her alone, she being prone to sadness, to sorrow, to a lack of gladness. It worries me incessantly, or if not that, then still a lot for a 10-year-old with an imaginary albatross. He's invisible to all but me. I see Alby easily, an albatross of modest height, his feather cloak tight a bit upon his paunchy seabird frame, the girth a sign of his past fame now come to roost as laziness, self-satisfaction, and excess. He ran with Charles Baudelaire and Coleridge in his wilder days. And sometimes he'll still share an absinthe, an anchovy pear, a polonaise, and a drunken haze with the derelict birds downtown. But mostly he just hangs around my blue suburban bedroom, gazing out the window at the maple tree, its solid branches and dancing leaves or icy twigs as the case may be weaving tales of degenerate gloom and languishing in malaise. He likes it here because of me, 10-year-old Oscar Mellonby, who understands melancholy. And also because when the fruit man rings, despite Albie's distrust of the old man's claim to eat fruit exclusively, he loves to hear the lists of things, delicious fruits and savories, like dimple-dotted dewberries, downy-dabbed ground cherries, purple pop plums and Senegal gum, black pendulous grapes with conical shapes, apricot tape from the Barbary Cape, and the effervescent glory spouts the fruit man loves to talk about. He comes, said Albie in a whisper. And sure enough, there was the truck, and there the man with hunter's cap, ears concealed with big ear flaps, bulbous nose with wiry hairs protruding from big nostrils, flared. His pockets filled, no doubt, with fruits we strain to think about. The doorbell rings and Albie swings his podgy form onto my shoulder as I tiptoe to the top of the stairs from where we see my mother's hair blown slightly by the winter air that enters the house as she opens the door. God bless the her honest herbivore was the fruit man's usual greeting. His livelihood being in produce, he took a stance against meat eating. But as I've already said, Albie felt this stance a sham and swore this merchant would eat ham and poultry, mutton, beef and lamb. He swore the peddler would easily trade an apple, fig, pear, peach or plum for albatross sopped in a marinade. Good day, old man, my mother said. It's good to see you come. The fruit man bowed his head. What fruit do you have today? My mother asked as Albie lay in wait for the copious list about to be heard. Beautiful fruit, fresh, 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 glistening, sparkling, crispy, the best. And then we waited for the fruit man's list. But the old man stood there shy and dumb. Bananas, asked my mother. Do you have some? The fruit man looked glum. He shook his head. No bananas today, I'm sorry to say. Concerned, my mother asked again what fruit the fruit man did have. And the old man answered as before. A beautiful fruit, fresh, 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 glistening, sparkling, crispy, the best. Well, what then? She grew impatient, the fruit man sensed. He straightened up in self-defense and gestured with naughty hands to say, now was the time to dispense with all pretense. Today I have special for you. And finally, Albie would get his list. 
He'd been working himself into such a tempest, I was surprised my mom didn't notice a ruffled albatross in a huff at the top of the stairs. But then again, to see the imagination of someone you love more than yourself can be frightening and is rare, even when it's noisy, big, and everywhere. Baldwins, Mutsus, Northern Spies, Box Ups, Crispins, Benoni, Arkansas Blacks and Dapple Gaps, Black Gillyflowers and Imperial Blues, Cox Orange Pippins and Magdalenes. I have three prismatic criterions, Macintosh's Yorks and one red Champlain. I'll bring out a basket and you can choose. But my mother stood confused. As the fruit man made his way back to his truck, the dismay I saw on my mother's face held me quietly in my place. It's a disgrace, she said, in reference to the old man's speech, although precisely what it was he said to make me fear to tread around her mood, I would not have understood if Albie hadn't spoken next. Dapple gaps. He relished the word with the fierce pleasure of a raptorial bird. There's no such apple as a dapple, he announced, as much to hear the sound as to volunteer the fact. And then I understood. The fruit man didn't have the stock of fruits he should. He had apples, no other fruit, and lacked any sense of shame to boot. At least that was my mother's claim. Before the old man could knock again, he returned with a basket full to the brim of apples that all looked much the same. My mother said, nothing today, and sent the fruit man on his way. She stood with her back to the hard fastened door as we listened to the pleading, begging, pounding, whining, pelting, thumping, kicking, and crying hurled like a tempest from the other side and waited for the tantrum to subside. When it did and silence reigned, she opened the door again, wishing, I think, that the gnarled old man might still be in sight to invite him back in. But the fruit man left without a trace except for one green apple placed in the snow now at her feet on our front step. One little green apple left there for free. She put it alone in a big glass bowl, a lonely apple without its tree. This is something we must not eat, she made herself clear to me. So I'm gonna stop there. That's the end of the first part. And then Oscar Mellenby goes on a a journey trying to track down the fruit man because his mother falls into a deep despair. Um, thanks, and we'll tag tag it over to John. Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, this second segment of mine will be a little bit more heavy and linked um, and even heavier and linkier as we move forward. So just so you know, um, this is a small poem, sort of one of my, I think I had an imagist phase once upon a time, maybe it never went away, but I really like this poem. So it's called Idol, Idol. The sky takes its first drag of sun the mist shakes its coat. Your standing form remains a piece of night, backlit, bitten into waking glare. When noon is piled on the air, your shadow down around your ankles, the breathless sky will kneel before you. This is sort of the beginning of the linkedness. This is a poem called The Island of Misfit Toys. which you will remember from the Christmas special, I'm sure. Please? Yes? OK, good. Okay. <laughs> Oof. OK. The Island of Misfit Toys. Huddled, if only there were opposition proper. They could take it. There's nothing they couldn't accept. They should be strong like a march, but there's the Baton League and the flags to wait through before the message. And there's TV and what's on. 
and feeling not very good or just not social. Gratitude for a lasagna sent two months ago. Strong loyalty, the kind that's a warning. Oh, may the peace of empty benches overtake you misdesigned souls. You were not meant to be born and meant not to act on it. So these next two poems uh, meditate on events right around y the Y2K thing, the period of time right around the explosion of all things technical. Um, and around that time I was, as I still am, I was fascinated with spirit mediums. Um, I just have to, I have to, I don't know why I have to tell you this because it's part of this next poem. So I was living in San Francisco and had been working on a project about Hart Crane's mom trying to write his last poem after his death with the help of spirit mediums. And it turned out that my friend, who I worked next to at a law firm, had been a spirit medium. So that's the first poem. Um, so the first poem is our first conversation about that, his being a spirit medium. And the second poem is also about him, but about New Year's Eve Y2K, <laughs> when it wasn't just the computers that went haywire. Um, so this first one is called In the Art House. And it's all it's sort of all over the page. This is sort of unusual for me. Um, but anyway, I, I think maybe the, the rhythm will make clear why. In the art house. You, you were about to speak. We sat in the dark, the real stubborn through the square window clicks and curses. You were telling me you were the spirit's favorite in all the cult. I love the line between belief and dismissal, or rather, the line which is true belief. The voices you spoke broke over against you, but one always took, always guided. I saw a scout troop, blindfolds, held hands, the electric touch of each to each. I thought snake, snake skeleton. I thought bullet train, tradition, thought, would I were so convincing amid candles? You were always speaking abandoned in company toward no spot, but for wending. And you, you took my silence correctly. Months later, we'd part badly after tragedy and crazed reply to tragedy that is cruelty to the crazed. But now, in the thick, telling about being the medium of choice, my, what was it? suspension of something, when you fell silent, you were going to tell me about how it felt, because I asked. You paused, and I think thought, and as your mouth opened, the screen lit up. So this next one is called either Job or Job, depending on how you're empathetically involved with it. Um, but this was all about the night of Y2K New Year's. Um, and I guess it, it will tell the story, so I don't need to tell you the story. So, but, um, and it's also in that same flowy, flowy, flowy kind of, kind of mode. I'll say Job this time, Job. It's no EMT's job to clean the scene nor the 911 not to leave one. I said you must go. You got to check. After the failed calls, after the threats, took Weedling till four. And he could have won if you hadn't. You could have. How I regret it, you said. Next morning, you, his camera in hand, recording his blood and spit on the kitchen floor to develop on recovery or what resembled recovery. Soon after, he'd threatened to kill you. I don't think it was pictures. Gestures planted that seed. I won't blame either of you, stuck in frames too big or frames too small for psychopaths. Needed a corkboard was my thought. But you were my friend, not him. I forgave you even when he told you he'd kill you. Forgave you even then. So this is a bit of a turn. Uh, the rest of these poems are largely, a good portion of the poem sort of meditates on the suicide of my friend, Brian Selsky. Um, I haven't really read from these before. Um, and uh, 
the, the ones that I read here is a series of linked poems toward the later part of the book. So it's the last like sort of 10 or so poems in the book. And the first, the first poem actually was written about a birthday party I was at while Brian was killing himself and realizing later on that I had written this poem <laughs> and that it was about that night, et cetera. And oh, it was also Yom Kippur, um, which we'll come back later. I'll talk about that. This is called Tent, Tent. Cortazar once wrote that happiness makes bad literature. But I wonder, as I watch you surrounded by friends flanked by the dogs telling a story about a woman visiting Tibet, who finding it hard to sleep, feeling like it was time to wake, though still dark, put her hand on the tent's canvas and found it heavy and wet. Her heat had called to a thousand leeches, like happiness to fate always the unsent delivered signal how alive how attractive and this is the beginning of the sort of jonah theme which is basically the last book that brian was reading when he died and um it also makes good sense with the way he was and who he was um, this is called specialty fish just to kind of set up on chipped ice banks full sprawl beside steps of fillet Outside scales, in feathers. Hands un and re-gloved unfurl each beauty. They stink of nothing. But heavy sound the ticking, the clanging of the hour. Close and closer, something breathing on your eyes, huge and tranquil. Your vision, pinched off at its periphery, is mouth-shaped, or it strikes you shaped by one. This is called Jonah, missionary in spite of himself. We ask ourselves if it had to happen, if it would have, despite us, and conclude that yes, it is convenient to think that. We sniff through your things, we cook your foods, we set your table. Out of politeness, we've invited people you hated. The friends look the truth. They are as little good to each other as they were to you. This is called Jonah, displeased with God for sparing Nineveh. The cup of bitterness tastes good, he thinks, empties it. Are there other cups, places for refills? But the cup sits o-mouthed and stupid as pissiness, and night falls. He puts the cup in the sink, sits back down, a pale ring on the table's wood, a mocking eclipse of all he desires. Zero, lipped by a fish. This is um, called At Your Door. At Your Door. At Your Door where the sky one last time sunk its hooked lung line at the open door. Closing it, did you feel this you've taught me? Pang, swell, and twitch, cut from a length of light, and then stitched. Um, this is a poem about uh, an essay on black boxes that was one of the things that Brian was preparing to present at Hampshire College at some point. So we spent a long time talking about black boxes and it ended up being a little bit sort of prescient, if you will. Your essay on black boxes. The plane falls from the sky. Still the moonlight shimmers on it. The letters on the plane, still in language. The trees come more into focus and quickly, they don't flinch. There are no expressions the world takes in change until change has passed, until the moment relaxes and the world touches its face gingerly. This is called fact and it's in a slightly different mode. It's, it's based on a Monty Python, a segment from Monty Python's Meaning of Life, I think. I'm pretty sure it's about, it's a, it's a cartoon or an animation of a tree and it's leaves and the leaves start falling off. Does this sound familiar? Anyway, I'll describe it. <laughs> okay. Wow, nobody sees Monty Python anymore. Uh, fact, <laughs> that's a fact. Um, fact. 
Like that Monty Python cartoon, which might not be a cartoon, but like that Monty Python cartoon where one leaf on a tree jumps free with no explanation, but a belief in individual action, which is shown to be a lie when another leaf leaps from grief. Then another follows. Finally, the tree stands bare. It means the season that it joins. And it is fact, suddenly, not tragedy, it owns. This is the sixth and final section of a poem called Thick Pronoun, um, which is a little too complicated to present just on its own. So I'll just present this last section, Thick Pronoun. We are lastly our names and first. In between something slightly less. Maybe the light through your dirty kitchen windows falling into reds, thickening, and maybe the push of your hand through your curls and the disorder of your teeth who sometimes laughed themselves out before you could catch them. This is a short poem called Kafkaesque, which is a word I've always wanted to use in every sentence. Um, Kafkaesque. When I say your life was Kafkaesque, I don't mean cramped or dim. I mean nose scratchingly eloquent and pressed to a puzzle end that argues with beauty. That's the end of that one. Um, this is called Honey in the Mouth. Now we're, we're, we're approaching the, the conclusion um, of this section, but uh, basically I don't like bitter in the belly, honey in the mouth. I don't know if you know that from the book of Revelations, but the idea is that there's a scroll and the angel eats the scroll or whatever. I don't even remember who eats what, but whatever. You eat it and then it makes your belly sick, um, more or less, and then the world ends. Well, the world doesn't quite end that fast. Honey in the mouth. In a dream, you are mid lasagna, placing mushrooms and saying, what you love will be taken from you. Eras and music you like that once spilled onto the esplanade, trimmed with chatter and happiness, they will pass. And with them, sorrow. You foil the dish, set it in the oven, unmit, sit. In the dream, I'm happy, but also furious with you for planning a dinner at my house and refusing to come. But that's why, you say, this night is different from all others, horseradish and honey on the same plate. I can't argue, it's funny and unfair to quote me quoting you. This is called Book of Jonah. Lonely, I read and read the last thing you read. Afternoon tugs, evening plies, morning has its leash in its mouth. Two chairs face sea swells, pelicans. I sit watch, the sea waiting to poach the sun. Here I am with my hand palm up between our chairs. I do know that some time ago, yours hovered, wanting to settle there. Another beach image poem called Kafka on the Beach. This is actually based on a picture of Kafka on the beach, which I describe, um, which you can find on the interweb. Kafka on the beach. He's youngish, about the age you will always be. Up to him, he'd also have left nothing but friends, and with them, photos. This one in a black bathing costume, arms akimbo and a neck, the V holds up that smile like a crab, wide to prove mastery. Spit up there, posing, you'd have pulled back your hair like Garbo, as if to say, Brian, he's not here right now, but if you think back to Garbo, young, You'll know how long he's been gone.
This is called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. October twilight, a solitary walker blocks down, scissors his legs toward and away. Now I've known you twice as long dead, as taken God bait. And my eyes have adjusted, saturated. Your death ends and you push through. And this is sort of the outro of the poem, sort of a pair with the intro or the poem I read earlier. Sleepy after the sun, the house is full of light spilt from our eyes until our eyes are empty and we see. Thank you. Thanks to those beautiful, uh, beautiful poems. Let's let them linger for a moment, and I'm going to try to prepare a little, I don't know, what are they called? Amuse bouches? You know, something to just sort of change the, the tone a little bit, because we're going to move into something else. Um, does anyone have a limerick by heart? Come on, everyone knows at least one limerick, no? Miranda, you must have a limerick. <laughs> So, um, so this book does um, engage in flirt with a little bit. Um, well, Kevin's not here, but he, I, oh, he's here. Yeah, what Kevin uh, uh, has been working on, which is light verse. Right? I'm not sure that some of these are even heavy enough to qualify, um, but I'm just going to read one limerick. There are two limericks in this book. Uh, it's on page 50. This is the first of them, Limerick of 1837. An Earl in 1837 feared he would not get to heaven. For when he counted his sins, there were the five sets of twins plus the lump, which adds up to 11. Um, there's also uh, a portion of this, which is a kind of um, excerpted collection of nonsense verse in the book. Um, so I actually had written a full manuscript of nonsense poems. Um, let me just move ahead here for a second. Uh, and rather than include them all, there's one full one in this book, but for the most part, what I did was I started crossing my own poems out. <laughs> And, um, and I left the first and last lines of every poem that I'd written, uh, not all of them, some of them weren't even worthy of that kind of appearance. Um, but the idea really is to uh, offer first and last stanzas of full poems, there are ellipses where all the missing stanzas appear. And, um, and I'm hoping that people will write the rest of the poems. Uh, themselves in between the uh, the first and last lines that I provided kind of as prompts and then that later we can compare and um, and wouldn't it be remarkable if um, if you ended up composing exactly the same nonsense poems that I did um, it would it would probably mean something so I'm just going to read a, a couple of these um, uh, blue little song the little blue book chirps and swallows like a rasper in the hollows. But of course, this promise earns only hungry moths and worms. And here's, here's another one that's pretty dramatic. You can write a really fun poem in between these lines. Paper pill. The exotic organ music made a bloody mess of Elgin. And then it ends with, we run rabbit with the organ music playing. <laughs> So have fun with those if you pick up the book. Um, and I'm gonna read a couple more poems, another part of a long one. But first, I, I suppose I call this one uh, um, a mad tab lib or tab mad lib poem. Uh, it's a kind of plagiarism poem. 
right? Uh, in which you alter only a few specific words of another poem and create a new poem out of it. Um, if imagination, like according to Coleridge, uh, is, quote, the living power and prime agent of all human perception, and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am, and is a power that dissolves, diffuses, dissipates in order to recreate and to synthesize into something completely new, then this mad lib mode of poetry writing is just the opposite. Right? It's even less imaginative than what Coleridge called fancy, uh, which was kind of just putting things together, but not really fusing them in any real way. So the materials of Mad Lib poetry are pretty much already made. And this is um, a very extreme version, uh, example of a Mad Lib poem. Uh, it's ready-made material is the poem uh, that some of you may know by Frank O'Hara, Why I Am Not a Painter. So. I dedicate this to Ian because he enjoyed hearing it the first time I read it at the Words and Music show. And to Alan, because he's a modernist. Because I my version is why I am not a modernist. I am not a modernist. I am a Victorianist. Why? I think I would rather be a modernist. But I'm not. Well, for instance. Hugh Kenner is starting an essay. I drop in, sit down and have a spot of tea, he says. I sip, we sip, I look down. You have modernism in it. Oh. I go and the days go by and I drop in again. The essay is going on and I go and the days go by, I drop in. The essay is finished. Where's modernism? All that's left is just dashes and blank space. It was too much, Hugh says. But me, one day I'm thinking of a color, eggshell. I write a book about eggshell. Pretty soon it is a multi-volume work, not just a few books, then another multi-volume work. There should be so much more, not of eggshell, of eggs, of how terrible shells are, and of the yoke of poverty. Years go by. It's even appearing in serialized periodical form. I am a real Victorianist. My multi-volume work is finished, and I haven't mentioned sexual intercourse yet. It's 39 volumes. I call it The Queen of Autumn's Sepulchre, a study in inscrutable codicils with official tables appended summarizing the report of the select committee on the 10 hour factory bill vindicated in a series of letters addressed to John Elliot Henry William Percival Flattell Esquire. One of the factory commissioners rebutted in a series of pointed responses composed in anagrammatic verse by the Reverend Reginald Winsome with accompanying charts in color depicting the condition of faith in workers who have not been subjected to factory education, annotated by Elliot John Edward Charles William Henry Drylock, MP, with insights upon factory education, its extension, and on the practicability of its application to other trades and occupations, such as potting, slate quarrying, copsy cutting, buddy ganging, mudlarking, rat catching, sawyering, shepherding, tin mining, dressmaking, slopping, gardening, and polling the willow. With enchanting stories, enlivening the annotations selected from chapters in the life and other gay romps of experience of a Dundee factory lad, an autobiography. With humorous engravings of curious factory lad exploits, as interpreted by Joseph Henry William William K. Claringbull, renowned engraver of 12 crochet edgings with illustrative engravings, edited by Henry John William Edgar G. Curling Hope, author of The Art of Crochet and My Working Friend, embellished with crochet patterns including Luna, Narva, Lola Montes, and Lymphata Lace, Dantel Passermenteri, Wheat Sheaf Pattern and Leaf Edging, derived from 
The Knitter's Friend being a selection of receipts for the most useful and saleable articles in knitting, netting, and crochet work, as well as from Madame Goubeau's crochet book, lightly embossed in soft, latescent paper along the edges of the most engrossing pages as selected by the author. <laughs> and one day in a little magazine, I see Hugh's essay called Modernism. <laughs> so the last piece I'm gonna read is, um, is the first part from the long poem at the end of the book. Uh, it's a long dramatic monologue. Um, and it inspired the cover. Uh, this is not the speaker of the monologue. This is Blaze, you could tell by his racing stripe. Um, but uh, the speaker of the monologue is Blaze's, bro Blaze's brother, who's uh, Fudge, who lived with Blaze and actually witnessed his death, which is the subject of the second of the three-part poem. I'm not gonna read the, the death part, um, I'm just going to read the, the opening. And um, the poem is called Fudge in Entropy. Part one, and this first part is called Lines Crossed Out Too, which is very confusing. But um, So Fudge in Entropy. Hi, I'm Fudge, a guinea pig, as if you couldn't tell. Not long haired, just regular haired. How did you get here? Do you like Nava's room? I like it, but it has gotten a bit lonely. Are you shy? Anyhow, this little blank notebook I'm nibbling on was originally given to dad, my owner, by the painter when he went to visit her in her studio sometime back in the 1990s. It's very small for a human notebook, like the size of my food bowl, only not heart-shaped, but rectangular. Black wrapped cardboard covered with red corners, lined pages inside, made in China, I think. Cheap, but small, which was the reason for the little gift. She gave it to him to prove a point about the impact of scale upon artistic process. In this case, the impact of the size of dad's medium, paper sheet, notebook, on how he was using words. My dad owner is a poet. In that dream, he brought the painter poems to read, to look at. The painter showed dad what she thought of the poems. She didn't read them as he would have expected. She didn't read them for meaning. She read them as lists of words and phrases, some powerful, others distracting. She worked on the words by taking a sheet of tracing paper, covering his poems and crossing out all of his words that got in the way of the emotion she was seeking. She felt that some words could get in the way, crowd out the potency of other more powerful words and phrases. These words are too crowded, she said, looking at one of his verbose pieces. There is deadly overcrowding, she said. She didn't say much more, but then she engaged with the words in front of him, crossing out, crossing some out to free the others to breathe, she said. It was a vivid gesture. She didn't explain what she was doing, but he could see her interact with certain words and he could see the results of her annihilation. The painter crossed out whole words, whole lines, whole pages. It was like, whoa. The rationale of her crossing out was legible in small quivers around her eyes and mouth. The quivers stood in for any explanation she might have provided in words. My own opinion is the quivers were the effect of energy newly released from the words she had transformed by murdering other adjacent ones. My owner dad, the poet, saw what she was doing and he understood it meant that his poems could no longer mean as he had intended them to mean. 
His poems once were too crowded. Now that had to stop. The painter would make it stop. The overcrowding in his poems was not fatal to people or to other creatures. Thanks be to God. Amen. Yes, I'm Jewish. There are Jewish guinea pigs. There are more of us than you might think. No, I don't look Jewish. I get that a lot. But really, what does a Jewish guinea pig look like? I'm not orthodox or anything, but I identify. I, I'm sort of an atheist, but I identify with my Jewishness culturally. You don't want to know what they sometimes do to guinea pigs. No, you, you really don't want to know. I'm very privileged. I can sit here with a fresh green bean in my hands and talk to you about art and poetry. I know all this stuff because my poet sometimes sleeps in my room and I can hear him dream. And I remember. On that visit, after the painter showed dad the lines crossed out, she gave him this tiny little book. Make your own poems with less words, she was saying. A poem should be able to fit onto one of these tiny book pages. You should be able to make a poem with just a few perfectly charged words. Ideally, your poems will have no words at all. The painter seemed to be saying all this when she gave him the cheap little book. He never did use it for writing. It fell from his night table onto the floor, and then Finnick took it under the bed for a few years, chewed it up a bit. Mom found it and plopped it in here just the other day. Something for me to do, I guess. It's funny how the poems my owner made from the painter crossing things out were eventually presented to her in an elaborately assembled artist's book and how the poems, dense little stones of affect now, were dead to her because the design of the book itself was too distractingly busy, too materially verbose, so to speak. The book that held these remains of the painters crossing out involved thread and rope and wood and overly thin Japanese paper and punctures and weavings and some kind of elaborate pulley system or something like that. It was technologically clear in the dream. It's more cinematically vivid than technically accurate in my memory. It really was halacious, though. Garish, I believe, is the correct word for it. Dad understood what the painter meant by the subtle disgust on her face as she flipped the much garnished book's pages, but at the same time, he thought the book, overwrought with stitchery and an elaborate binding structure that required the pages to unfold in a perplexing way, was beautiful. It was made by Dad Poet's friend, the bookbinder, a fellow he respected and loved and in whose apartment he was renting a room back then. Dad understood what the painter meant when she said the book's distractions neutralized whatever charge had been gained by pruning the poems into conductors of feeling. The painter was strong, violent in the confidence of her opinions. She knew that the book was overcrowded. She knew why the newly distilled, nearly vaporized poems were ineffective in this book of ruffles, eyelets, and gears. Out of sympathy and love for his friend, the bookbinder, Dad tried to assert a counter argument to this confident knowledge of hers, but the best that he could do was think, not to know. He thought it was beautiful. He knew that it was not beautiful. He knew that it was halushes, to be honest. Sometimes I think means I know, but I wish I did not know that this certainty that I know is really true. I'm going to stop there and um, uh, thank you very much for listening to both of us for such a <laughs> length of time. And I'll invite Catherine back for a last word. Oh, I do want to do one last thing before I leave. I have a, a mug. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone can see this. Um, if anyone can guess who's on the mug, I'm going to leave it over there. I'll just leave it there afterwards. And um, I have a, a free copy of my book to give you. 
it's a, it's a Victorian figure. Thank you, John and Jason. I have to say that I was looking at the mug while you were reading, and I was wondering if you had brought the mug or if maybe Force Space had given you the mug. And as I think it was dream, okay, because I won't say which poem I was looking at it particularly and was wondering if it was based on that. But so I'm glad to know the mug. <laughs> it uh, it is a prop, and um, yeah, the uh, <laughs> I have I have my own gas, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll wait till after. Um, I'm just going to take a little peek over here at the screen to see the comments from those tuning in. And it's a, a silent, a silent group on the chat, but I think very, uh, I would say that there is much applause also happening here in the online audience. Um, quite a few people I can see um, are tuning in tonight, so thank you for tuning in. Um, so. Um, I was thinking that the audience here perhaps could do another round of applause that is also channeling the round of applause from the online audience. So let's hear it. Let's hear it. So uh, just a couple announcements to end things off. Um, if you, especially to the online audience, if you're tuning in tonight or if you're here uh, and you're thinking, wow, I really would like to hear these poems read again, or perhaps even hear some of the poems from the books that we didn't hear tonight, uh, both Jason and John will be reading at Argo Books, um, at the new location of Argo Books, and you can find all the information for that event and how to sign up. Uh, it's free, you just have to sign up online. Uh, it's next week on Friday, December 3rd at 7 o'clock, um, and uh, you can you can hear them live again. Um, and in fact, if you, if you aren't here tonight, do come down and check that out. So December 3rd, 7 p.m., Argo Books. Uh, for more poetry here in Force Space, I do just want to give a little plug to another hybrid poetic event happening here on December 1st with Kai Kello, Carolyn Bergeval, and Juana Avesilakoy. It's presented by Force Space and also Concordia Writers Read series. Uh, it will be here, but um, streamed online. So do check that out on December 1st at 2 o'clock. And before we head off into the snow or over to the book table, which uh, I want to draw your attention to over there, um, Argo Books is here tonight selling copies of both Jason and John's books. Um, they'll be here till 6.30, so if you really want to grab a book tonight, go head over to the table right away. Um, before we do that, before we do book table into the snow, chatting here for a little bit before we go, um, I would like to say that I'm quite confident that there's quite a few guinea pigs out there tonight that I think are rustling in their wood chips with great joy. Um, and I'd like to invite John and uh, Jason up here uh, for one last round of applause for them to take a bow and thank you for your readings tonight. And thank you to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to Force Space. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Catherine, for, for that expert moderation, as always. I don't have too, too much to say because I want to give folks the opportunity to go visit the book table, etc. But I'll just remind those of you who were in the space with us today or those of you on Zoom that we did live stream this session onto YouTube, so it's available there now. If you don't know how to find it, just go onto YouTube and look up Concordia University for Space, and it's the first video you see if you want to relive tonight's reading. Okay, folks, on that note, we'll uh, close up the Zoom. And Catherine, there were a lot of applause in the Zoom after you kind of <laughs> held both people to, to uh, have their say. Um, anyhow, congrats again. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.